Donna Ferrado. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for bringing me here. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to present to you um, the many stories that are so close to my heart, which is finding ways to stop abuse of women and children and men, how to bring us all together as a race. That's my purpose as a photographer, but also as a human being. When I started with this work back in 1981, I didn't know about domestic violence. Nobody was talking about it in the newspapers. There were no shows on TV like, you know, cops. And um, there, were, there were no conversations about domestic violence. It was truly one of the most hidden secrets in our popular culture back in those days. There were shelters, but nobody ever heard about the shelters. Nobody even knew how to get into a shelter. And in truth, nobody had ever been with a camera in a shelter. When I begin this presentation, you're going to see what started me to think about this. Because back in those days, in the early 80s, um, I was still thinking that it was a woman's right to be sexually liberated, to be able to be with whatever man in whatever situation she wanted to be with. I, I've never believed in fidelity, and that's why I really failed as a wife. Um, and, and it's a good thing that I failed as a wife, because when I was married, I was really dedicated to putting my husband through law school. And I worked as a legal secretary and worked as a cocktail waitress. I did everything to make sure that he was going to be a lawyer. But then, when he became a lawyer, and I realized I didn't want to be a lawyer's wife. What the hell am I doing in this situation? And although I loved him, and maybe I've never loved any man as much as I loved him, I realized for my own sanity, I had to get out of that marriage, hit the road. Why not take a camera? My dad was a photographer, and he taught me about the excitement of capturing real life with the camera. I mean, he always documented our family life, the kids in the neighborhood. He worked with Leicas, the you know, reflex cameras. He, he, he was a heart surgeon, and he even photographed his own surgeries. I mean, I have amazing pictures of him and doing this. And he would actually, when I was growing up, and I'm from Italian background, Italian-Irish, he would bring home lungs and hearts and you know, pieces of the human anatomy and put them on the dinner table as I was eating and I'd see him with like a, you know, a, like a, a light table that he would set up to photograph these, these parts of lungs um, and talk to me about it, you know, how this guy got cancer, how bad it was to smoke cigarettes. That's why with all my assistants I'm always trying to, you know, whip them into shape and get them to stop smoking. Um, but, you know, my father really made a big impression on me. And I was the oldest child in my family, but in the entire family of many, many grandchildren. So being the only child, the one out in the front like a maverick, kind of set into motion the patterns of a lifetime. Um, I have never been someone to follow anybody else. Um, I, I don't really listen to other people unless I spend enough time with them so that I start to understand really what's going on. And I've always tried to read a lot and inform myself, but I'm not a good student. I was never good in college, never good in high school. I was always a troublemaker. So I've had to find my own way through all kinds of problems. And, with a camera, I've been able to um, really like insinuate myself into people's lives without even ever knowing what I'm searching for, why I am there. When I started with domestic violence, as I told you, nobody was talking about it. So in those days, I was trying to figure out what is a woman to do when she wants to be free, when she wants to be liberated, when she wants to really find out who she is. And um, for a while, I traveled around Europe with my camera, hitchhiking, living in people's houses, babysitting, anything I could do. After I left my marriage, I, I would do anything 
I never, and also, I, l let me tell you, I don't believe in women, unless they have a lot of kids, I don't believe in women taking alimony or taking support from men. I think women have to really do this on their own. I really believe in a woman, the, you know, women are super powerful. And so I want to see myself standing up and finding my way in the world without having to rely on a man. And, um, and so that's what I was doing, even as I was traveling around Europe with this camera, um, trying to understand from people that I would meet, well, you know, you say you have a good marriage, and show me, let me live with you, and let me see what your life is like. And when I came back to New York in um, 1979, after living in Paris and Belgium for a few years, just bouncing around, you know, like, like a total... Uh, I mean, I was like a homeless person, but I would find people who would let me into their lives and they would teach me things. When I came back to New York, this, this phenomenon was happening called swinging. And um, so I wanted, and there were like S&M clubs, all this sort of stuff, and I wanted to know about it. So I would go to these places and I would watch all these things happening, things that when I was growing up in Ohio, nobody ever talked about this kind of stuff. And I came from a super traditional family, even though my father turned out to be not a faithful man, certainly nobody ever knew about it until much, much later in life. Um, nobody talked about the things that I always felt we should talk about. I don't really believe in keeping secrets. I don't really believe in separating sex from our daily life. Um, I think that the more we're honest about all of this stuff, we, you know, the ha happier we're going to be. And that is the point of being on this earth, is to try to figure out a way to be happy. No matter how much work we have to do, no matter how much abuse we've suffered as young people, you know, the buck stops with us, with the decisions we make. <clears throat> so, I went to Plato's retreat, and I started photographing in this swingers club, um, and really looking for amazing people who could kind of pull me into their lives so that I could tell the stories of why they were swingers. Um, I'll tell you one incredible story there. You know, like um, one, one, one night I was at the club, and I was really one of the only people who could actually be there on certain nights with a camera around my neck, my little Leica, and the little white towel. And I always wore little white booties because there was a lot of sperm all over the floor and I didn't want to <laughs> slip in it, you know. <laughs> so um, what happened was I was sitting there watching all the activity, like in the mat room and et cetera. All of a sudden I saw my hero, my hero walking into the room with this short guy and another beautiful woman there on both sides. It was Mary Ellen Mark. And there she was, you know, walking with this guy who had, you know, was a really short guy with a big chest. And this beautiful blonde was on the other side. And I was thinking, wow, what is Mary Ellen Mark doing in a place like this? Um, and you know all of her famous work in the nightclubs. And I mean, I'm sure if you've studied Mary Ellen Mark, you know that, of course, she's, she's not adverse to seeing what goes on in the dark side of our society. Well, um... This, this old man that she was with came up and started talking to me at one point. And, uh, hey there, Kevin, get in here and take your coat off. <laughs> so uh, I said, uh, so he was telling me things in a way that I found really offensive about a lot of the women in, in these situations. And so I finally said to him, you know, and his name, I didn't know his name at the time, I'm going to tell you that. But, uh, but I said to him, you know, I have to get back to work. I'm a photographer, I can't sit here and chit-chat with you. And um, a little while later, my hero came up to me and she said, look it, I don't know who you are, but do you know who you were talking to? And I said, no. And she said, well, he happens to me to be one of the most prestigious filmmakers in the world. Have you ever heard of Lawrence of Arabia? Yeah. Have you ever heard of Bridge Over the River Quite? Yeah. How about Suddenly Last Summer? Of course, you know. Well, she said, that's Sam Spiegel. And he really loved talking to you, so you, you better be nice to him. <laughs> and the rest was history, you know, after that. Of course I was nice to him. But, um, but, uh, but that really was like, I think that, you know, telling you a story like this is because I want you all to realize that you can go anywhere. You don't have to be like 
the perfect groomed photographer shaped by ICP and all of this sort of stuff. You have to go by your instincts. You have to go by your smell, your sense of smell. You have to go out into the world like an animal with your camera and be able to tell who's maybe going to get you in deeper, who's going to teach you something. How deep can you go without sacrificing your own integrity and your ideals? You have to figure these things out. Don't think that a school like ICP or any other schools are going to teach you anything. You've got to figure it out yourself. So in, in Plato's retreat, I saw this amazing couple. That They seemed to be the most beautiful couple in Plato's retreat. And at the time, I didn't see either of them swinging with anybody, but I was really impressed by their, their, their like style and, and how elegant they were. And so eventually I started, I was photographing them. Let's, let's start these pictures. And so you can see the first couple that started me on uh, the story about violence against women. Oh, is that in my hands? No? No, we got it. OK. Go ahead. So this is it. This is this is the couple right there. Larry Larry Levinson is. Can we go back to that so you can read these captions a little bit better? Um, let's just take the time. Can you hold it on there for a minute? So that's Larry Levinson, the King of Swing. If you want to see something about Plato's Retreat, you can also rent the movie on Netflix, American Swing. I'm in that, so you're welcome to rent that anytime. <laughs> Um, so this is Larry Levinson, and this is the couple that I thought were the epitome of the happily married couple, and that she was a very liberated woman who could be with anybody she wanted to, and that's what made sense to me, because I'm a 60s kind of girl. Um, and this is what started it all. But when I first moved into their house, I was there because I wanted to show their swinging life and how things meshed with their family, how the family was kept separate, all the children seemed to be very happy. Um, I thought that this man truly loved and respected his wife. I had no idea what was really going on. Go ahead. Let me see. 1980. Pardon? You should pause on each picture for a minute. I think so, yeah. So as you can see, you know, he looks like a dapper guy. He's from Sweden. They're both from Sweden. He was a, a, a multimillionaire and he'd made his fortune designing software programs for the biggest corporations in the country. Um, and they lived in this huge mansion right next door to Richard Nixon. And it seemed in those days like swinging was totally like, you know, out in the open, very cool. The cops would come to their house and, you know, have a glass of whiskey and just hang out and no, you know, I know that they were trying to get the Nixons into their little thing out in the suburbs, but, you know, Pat and Dick were, you know, very, very attached to each other and weren't interested in anything else. But, you know, he, it seemed like he really believed in his wife being free as time went on. And it took me a year before I really saw what was happening in this family. So that's why I'm saying, you know, you have to stick with people for a long time. Things don't reveal themselves to you very easily. You have to really want to see what's going on. Go ahead. Also in those early days, um, I was shooting mostly with Kodachrome 64, and I would bounce... Um, a light into the ceiling. I was always experimenting. You know, I could shoot black and white, but I really wanted to shoot in color. So most of the time, um, I was shooting color. And it wasn't until the night of uh, the fight in the bathroom that I had to use whatever was in my camera, which was a roll of tracks. Go 
Let's stop on that picture after you. Um, okay, let, yeah, go back there just for a second. So the other thing you should know is that at the time when I was doing the story, I was pregnant. When I was doing the story on the swingers, this couple. Um, so at a lot of the orgies that they would have at their house, you know, I was like, you know, going from being two months to three months to finally like eight months pregnant. And sometimes the people who were there would say, why, why do you have this photographer, you know, taking pictures of us? And Elizabeth, the, cu the couple, the woman, the wife, would just say, oh, she's just the, pr the pregnant photographer. Don't pay her any mind. But this, when I went back to them, it was because um, I really, I, you know, over, over Christmas time, they had had a party where all the teenagers were involved with the, with the orgies, with the doing drugs, with the, the mafia was in there, dealing coke to the kids. I, was, I wasn't even taking pictures at that time. I was so busy trying to tell the kids to stop doing this and talking to the mafia and saying, why are you doing this with this poor family? You know, why are you in here? So after that party, I, I went away from them. I thought I didn't want to ever see these people again. And it wasn't until the spring when the wife, after my child had been born, that the wife called me up and said, I'm really terrified. He's got a gun. He's trying to make me think I'm going crazy. Will you please come back and help? So I took my daughter. That's how much I thought that I was safe going back into this house. My little daughter, Fanny, was in the basket right here. And when I first came into the house, I saw how skinny they had gotten. I saw the you know, the circles under their eyes, and I pulled Lisa aside and I said, your problem is you're doing so much cocaine. You, you're, you're not in your right senses anymore. You've got to get rid of the cocaine. <clears throat> now, you know, like, I'm not a photographer like Larry Clark or a lot of photographers who will say, great, cocaine, let's have an orgy, let's do a gangbang. I'm not one of those photographers. <laughs> I see what damage cocaine does on families and on everybody's mind. So I really believed that I was right to tell her not to do cocaine anymore. But I had no idea the repercussions. And what happened was she hid the cocaine. She hid it that day. So we were all sitting outside in the backyard sending ourselves. That's their little son, the youngest child, Charlie. And all of a sudden, Garth, the husband, came out and tried to drag her into the house. And I picked up my Leica and took this picture, which made him stop. Of course, right? That's sensible. We were out in the backyard. Of course he stopped. <clears throat> he went inside, and we didn't see him for the rest of the day. Nobody said anything. I never even said anything to Lisa. I was just kind of going with the flow. Okay, we, you know, we stopped this, this sure accident from happening. Um, but then... That night, late that night, as I was sleeping down the hall from them, I could hear Lisa screaming. I put my little girl in the closet because, you know, I knew he had a gun. And I picked up my Leica and I went running down to their bedroom. Let's, let's see the next shots. <clears throat> First thing I saw when I went into their room was him pulling his arm back to, to slap her. He went to hit her. I took the picture. I took the picture. I'm very proud that I took this picture. And I know that if I had not taken this picture, none of you would ever know about domestic violence, really. By taking this picture, and I, in my mind I said, either I'm going to make him stop or else... I'm going to be able to prove to people what I've seen here tonight because it was really hard for me to believe that everything was happening like this. When he went to hit her again, I grabbed his arm and I said, what the fuck are you doing? And he threw me down and he said, she's my wife and I have to teach her that she can't lie to me. She's always obeyed me. Tonight she's lying to me. So stay out of it because I know my own strength. Go ahead. And then all of this began to happen, you know? He's like shouting at her like, she, like she's deaf and threatening her. Um, this was after I had stopped him from hitting her again. He's pulling things out of the cupboards, like saying, where is that coke? You know, he's like a total maniac. 
I'm not understanding what the hell is going on. It's all happening in a matter of minutes. But the one thing I was freaking out was that they had, there was all mirrors everywhere. And I'm freaking out saying, oh my God, I don't like seeing myself in there. I mean, everything's going so quickly. I didn't want to see myself, but I couldn't get around it. There were mirrors everywhere. This was really scary. When she ran into the bedroom to call the police, and she's telling them that her husband is beating her, and then he pushes her down and he grabs the phone and he's like saying, yeah, my wife is beating me. And I'm just watching this, trying to make sense of it, taking pictures. I really had what you call the bird's eye view into understanding what goes on in homes like this, where the woman is made to feel crazy. Even with the police, the man will say, ah, she did this, she did that. So all the blame will be on her. She is, of course, hysterical, trying to you know, get somebody to understand what she's going through. But it's impossible. The story is already mapped out by the man. It's already done. It's a done deal. The police didn't even come that night. Remember, this is 1982. Well, we can stop right here for a second. Um, I don't. I, I'm. The story is never done for me. I don't really. I don't. I don't work with editors at magazines like a normal person. I mean, when I first started this story about swinging, it was for Japanese Playboy. After the story turned into domestic violence, nobody wanted it. Nobody was interested. Nobody. Um, I couldn't get this story sold anywhere. I, I would take it into magazines like People and show them the pictures. And I remember this one, the guy who's the most important person in time life, um, Richard Stolle, he founded People magazine. He looked at this series of pictures that I had of Garth and Lisa in the bathroom, and his leg was shaking so bad, he couldn't control it. And all he said to me was, do you have releases, model releases? And I said, well, I have some. He said, go back and get them from People magazine. And I did that. And he still wouldn't publish it. He was afraid that he was going to get sued. Um, you know, I, I started to realize, though, as I did all these things and I got rejected again and again by magazines, I started to realize that it wasn't my time to publish anything, that I still had to keep learning. And I had to do things right. And I've always been a very big proponent in photographers who are doing uncomfortable stories like this to get releases from everybody. Um, because that's the only way you can get tripped up when it comes to publishing. And also if the people want to sue you, which people have tried to do with me in the past. Go ahead. Oh, this is, stop it just for a sec. So that's Lisa there. That's her daughter Jeanette up at the top on the right, who was sexually abused by the stepfather, the oldest daughter. And these are the three boys that grew up seeing their mother abused in the orgies and everything. Amazingly enough, these three boys have turned out really well because they weren't raised by their father. Lisa got out of that marriage and she raised her children herself as a physical therapist. Only the daughter Jeanette, who was sexually abused by Garth, was seriously, fatally damaged um, because of all the sexual abuse. And she became an alcoholic. Let's keep going. Um, and a drug user, she never had a, you know, a period where she felt good about herself. At one point, stop here. At one point, her violence was so bad as an alcoholic that even her mom didn't know what to do with her. There were no detox centers that would take her anymore. So I brought her back to New York to live with my daughter and I, Fanny. I mean, for Fanny, this whole thing has been such a cycle of her being exposed to these kinds of stories. Um, it would be very interesting to really like, put Fanny's brain under a microscope and understand how just hearing the stories and witnessing the violence through the photographs has affected her. Um, but for Jeanette, uh, you know, she was in such bad shape that we 
I brought her to New York and I detoxed her, which took about 10 days to get all the alcohol out of her system. Um, and she was okay for about a year and then she went back to it and then she died. And that hurt so much. And here's Garth, the, you know, nothing, no consequences for him. His wife always protected him when he was brought up on charges of sexually abusing little girls in the neighborhood, friends of his son. And the mother, Lisa, would always defend him because for a long time she couldn't believe, even though he was beating her, she couldn't believe that he would sexually abuse children. This guy is such a deviant, and he completely got away with it. And this woman, this ridiculous woman, married him, and then they moved to St. Petersburg, Florida, and she, she took care of him till the day he died. And he sent me this picture about uh, two years before he died, just to show me how great he was doing. But from that point on, after the Lisa and Garth story had begun, I realized that I needed to really see it. I didn't want it just to be one family story. I had to look at it, you know, through, through the wide glass, through like the fisheye lens. And I had to get out in the world. I had to get into those shelters because nobody had ever been in there. To get into the shelters was a pretty hard task. I mean, there have been no other photographers ever who have lived in battered women's shelters and been able to have like total access to everybody. As long as the women had, like signed a release with me, I could be there. And I didn't need every woman to, to agree to be part of my stories. I just wanted at least two or three. I wanted to show what they were doing. I needed to ride with the cops, you know, like 24-7. I had to get that permission, not the magazines that I work for. I had to convince them. I mean, I've never worked in a protected way, like going with NGOs or anybody like that who sort of paved the way for me, and then I have to give them what they want. I do things my way. And to get into these places, I always had to tell the stories, what I was doing, why I was doing it, convince people to let me in. I had to live in shelter in hospital emergency rooms, waiting like a vulture, like a vulture, like all night long for a battered woman to come in. And then I had to get permission from her family, sometimes even from her. You know, I'm sorry this is the worst moment in your life. Yeah, you look really bad. I want to take your picture, and I want to put it in Life magazine. Is that okay? You know, basically, that's what I said. Every home I went into, I had to say that. I said to the cops, you will never have to speak up for me. I, I tell it my way. So for me, being a photographer has always been, you know, expressing myself, saying what I think and what I feel and how I'm going to do it the right way. I'm not going to fuck up any of these stories. You know, they're not going to, I can't blame anybody else. If the wrong facts come out, that's my fault. I'm the bad one. So I've always worked really, really hard to get my facts straight. And this was important. I didn't know I was going to do a book back in the early 80s. I just wanted to see what was going on. Because it was still a huge secret, and it was ugly. If you walk in any of these women's shoes, if you walk in the cops' shoes, it's really, if you're the kids, and I always felt like the kids, it's super ugly to be in those, in those environments. And it feels like nothing is ever going to change or get better. Go ahead. <coughs> stop right here. Um, this, this is an amazing moment. I mean, I've been riding with cops for hundreds and hundreds of hours in Minneapolis, and I wanted to be there because, and this was for Life magazine, I was on assignment for Life, because in, in Minnesota they had the best laws that were just being brought in to protect women. Um, with in police situations, like they're, you know, 
most women are understandably afraid to press charges. They're terrified. Because if they press charges and then he gets out again, he's going to come back and hurt them worse. So with the mandatory arrest law that was passed in the mid-'80s, um, it meant that the police could make the arrest on their own if they just saw any kind of injuries or sign of, you know, damage, physical damage, they could make the arrest. Unfortunately, they couldn't keep the man in there. You know, it would only be overnight. And if she didn't press charges, he would get out again. In this situation, well, I, you know, I'd been riding with the cops for quite some time, and I decided, like, I needed to go in the daytime. I wasn't seeing things that were different from what I saw in all the other times I'd been out riding with the cops. So this was about 9 o'clock in the morning. And, um, you know, we got a call that there was a domestic happening, and so, like, three cop cars showed up, as in one of them. Um, we go running into the house, and I'm fumbling with my flash because all the, the shades were drawn, and it was very dark, even though it was 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I see the, the, the mother, the wife, at the door, and I said to her, excuse me, ma'am, I'm, I'm with Life Magazine, and... Uh, do, can you give me permission to be able to photograph with whatever's going to happen here? Because, um, come in here, Bobby. Yeah, look at that. So, um, so, so I said, I need to be able to photograph whatever's going to happen here tonight or this morning. Um, and she said, and I said, don't worry. I will get a release from you before we ever publish. So as I went into this house, suddenly... All hell was breaking loose. Let's go to the next picture. This kind of stuff, where like that I had always heard about, but I've never seen or been able to photograph, where the the husband resists even a, in a very minor way, and suddenly all the police are on top of him, exerting all their force to subdue him, and the wife was screaming at them. You know, she's saying stop. You know, she was really on her husband's side, and she saw that her husband was being hurt. This is very common reaction for women in these situations. They don't want the man to get hurt. They just want him to stop hurting them. The whole series of images here is truly insanely powerful. Okay, let's stop right here. So what happened was when I was leaving the house, and actually go back to the first photograph with Diamond. <coughs> The one with the little boy, yeah, before, before. Where is that picture? Uh, no. Yeah, this one. So what happened was um, that little boy started to shout at his dad and said, you know, I hate you for hitting my mother. I call the police because I want to make you stop. I'll do anything to make you stop, Dad. And I was stunned. I'd never seen anybody stand up to an abuser, not the cops, not the judges, you know, nobody in the neighborhood. Everybody's scared to death of this guy. That's why he gets away with it. And you can see even the cops were blown away by the courage of that boy shouting at his dad. And what was really strange was that I couldn't even see when I was taking the pictures because I was bouncing the strobe into the ceiling. So I didn't even see that on the TV was a scene very much like what was unfolding in front of my eyes, where a man was pulling a woman towards him. And um, I mean, it was just, but I knew that this was the picture. This was it. And when I went to the door to leave with the police, and I was going to ride to the station with the husband who was being arrested, um, I said to the wife, about that release, you know, the, do you want to sign that right now? And she said, what, what magazine did you say you were from? And I said, Life Magazine, thinking, oh, I should be impressed. <laughs> she said, I thought you said Ebony. No, 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 no. <laughs> and she said, get out of here. You know, so I had to go back to New York to my editor, said Life Magazine, without a release. Of course, this was the picture. They wanted it so badly. So I said, don't worry. I'll go back to Minneapolis, and I'll get a release from everybody. And I did. I mean, I went back there, and by that time, the husband and wife were back together. And I told them, I said, look, it, this was a really horrible moment that you were going through. Um, I'm glad you're back together. That's good. That shows that you've you know, worked things out. 
But this picture is one of the most intense pictures that I've ever seen that shows what a child feels. And we need, we need to see that. We need to see what the children feel. So can I publish it? And they both said yes, and they both signed a release. When the magazine came out with the story, they sued me. They sued, magazine, they sued Life magazine. The, the wife was so angry about this picture. But I had a release. I had an ironclad release. So her, her lawsuit didn't go anywhere. Um, and then I found out, like 20 years later, that she was still trying to sue the police department. She was still trying to sue everybody. She couldn't get over the fact that her son had really done the right thing. She couldn't give him that. So this poor boy was so, he, he, you know, he was so ashamed of himself for all these years, feeling really bad, like he caused the family all this trouble. Go ahead. In, let's stop here. In this situation, um, I actually was physically abused by a woman who was in the house. A lot of people always ask me, did you ever get hurt when you're photographing in these situations? I've never been hurt by an abuser. This was the only time. Um, as I started to take pictures and I hadn't had a chance to say to anybody, is it okay to take pictures? A woman who had been beaten by her husband was hiding out in the house. And she came running out of the house as all this was going on. And she jumped on my back and she's trying to smash my camera, break the flash off of the camera. Um, she's shouting at me, you can't take pictures. The cops were shouting at her, we're going to mace you too, because they had just maced him. I'm pleading with her to get off me because I'm saying, I'll, I'll come back and talk to you tomorrow, but i got to do my job right now. Um, actually... I went back and, and spent time with this family. I, I spent a lot of time with them because he, was, he went to jail for a couple of months because he had assaulted the officers, not because he'd beaten his wife. Um, but when he went back, I moved into their house too and spent a lot of time with them. And that story was published in uh, the New York Times magazine. Um, but this, you know, this woman was just, just it, you know, it's... It's really frustrating to talk with women who are living with hell, with a, a hellish husband, and their children are suffering so much. And yet, and a woman knows that things are wrong. Like this woman told me at the time, you know, my husband watches me like a hawk. And the other thing was, was that I knew that this man had physically abused his first wife because I met her at a support group meeting. She told me the story of what she'd gone through with him and then, you know, two days later, I'm on the front porch and I'm seeing him do it to another woman. So I was really out to get this guy, as you can imagine. And it was disturbing to me that here's a woman who knows what he did with the previous woman, and she still goes with him, and she still subjects her children to him. And then she told me that, you know, it's hard for her because she can't ever get any time alone. He wants to go everywhere she goes, even the supermarket. The only way she can get away from him is to lock herself in the bathroom for two hours and take a very long bath. That's the only way. Go ahead. This is Diamond, the boy who you see shouting at his father.
Um, let's stop here for a second. The idea for Unbeatable Women came to me, um, you know, I'd say pretty much in the early 2003 or so, um, when I was trying to find some of these women, and I did find Ruth, and I found out that she had actually done what I prayed she would do, which was she never went back to the man. She said she was never going to go back to him, even though her mother <laughs> tried to push her and saying, you know, your children need a father, it's the right thing to do, he didn't mean to do it, you know, all the usual excuses. But what she said to me and to her mother and to herself was that, you know, after he beat her so badly for supposedly, you know, whatever she was, she was working in a hospital and to su supplement the family income. Um, they had two sons together, and he was jealous all the time, as you know, most abusers are, whether it's a male or a female. They always have a problem with jealousy. They always feel inadequate. That's why they use force. They try to coerce the one who's more free and more self-confident. They try to break them down and make them feel like they're going to get into very big trouble if they don't obey. So her husband was doing that to her, and he left her with those. He beat her like this, in, in you know, her black eyes, broke her nose, her cheekbones, her ribs, in front of her two children. And what she said to me was, I will, I will never go back to him. You know, my children don't even recognize who I am right now. There's no way. When I, when I w talked with her on the phone years later, she told me that she was remarried to a really wonderful guy um, and he was, uh, you know, like a community rights attorney. And, and she was happy, and her kids were happy. And I started to understand, this is what women have to do. And this is what we have to talk about more. The positive things that come out of leaving an abusive relationship, male or female. You know, women are abusers too. I'm not going to, you know, try to deny that. Women can be just as crazy and dangerous as men. It's not in the same statistics, not as many as women who are like, most women are overpowered by the male. So they have to figure out ways, usually psychologically, um, how to get out of that situation. The males have the physical power. But this is when I started thinking how important it was to have more women like Ruth becoming the focus of my work. Because for me, it's not just enough to show how bad things are, I want to show how we make things change. It's all about change for me. I wouldn't do this work as a photographer if I didn't see things changing and I didn't see people's lives getting much better when they turned it around on their own. We have to do that work. So, so she's really, she's on the cover of the book, but she's also one of the first unbeatable women. Um, just stop right here for a second, too. Also, um, you know, I've lived in many, many shelters, and I've gotten very close with a lot of domestic violence groups, and I know how overworked they are, underfunded. So I know that these hotlines rarely work. I know that a lot of times women will call these hotlines, and it's just a lot of BS, because nobody's picking up the phone. These women are desperate. They know they're going to get killed if they are any, seen anywhere around this man. Um, so they, when they call a hotline, they need help right away. I turned my own phone line into a hotline, and I advertised for it. We didn't have internet in those days, but I, this was in the 90s. I let people know across the world that they could call me if they were having trouble. Um, everybody in my house knew that. You know, we'd get strange calls in the middle of the night, and the phone would always be given to me. And if a woman was really desperate and she didn't know where to go, I'd say, come to my house. And so, again, you know, Fanny and my husband, Johnny, the, this is what they were living with. And it was fantastic, really. I think it was really fantastic. Um, <laughs> you know, like, here's a mother that she knew that the, the courts were going to send her daughter back to live with the guy who, her, husband, her father, who was raping her. I mean, I always taught my daughter, you know, it's very nice to have a father, but a lot of fathers are not good fathers. You know, a lot of them are using their children sexually in every way possible. So, so if you have a good father, great, you know, really honor him. But if you don't have a father, you know, I say damn the courts that send these children back to the men. Um, and this happens far too often. So this was, 
this was a beautiful mother and daughter who came and stayed with me for over a month until they were able to find a good home to go to with people that they trusted. Is everybody able to read these captions fast enough? No? Um, do you want me to go back a couple? Living in a shelter is where so many women first begin to understand the meaning of the word em empowerment. You know, it's really not a cliche, that word. It's a very beautiful word because it's, it's you know, it's where you're around like-minded people and you're getting a lot of the information, which is more valuable to you than bullets. You know, it's like you start understanding that you have rights. You don't have to put up with this stuff. It doesn't matter if he says he's married you. It doesn't, I mean, I really want to get into the immigrant population, too, because so many of the women who are living in these, you know, who are from other countries, they are coming here with their customs from their, their, own, their you know, the cu countries they've left in the past, and they really believe that the men have all the power. I'm sorry, you know, anybody who believes that, that the man is like God, and God is the head of the church, and God is the head of the universe, and... Man is the closest thing to God, and so we give him all the power. That's, that's really dangerous thinking. And that's how women and children get very badly hurt and taken advantage of. So in the shelters, they start to understand the facts. You know, what are the facts about women and children's lives? And nobody has the right over, over you. No matter if they are your father or they are your husband, nobody has the right to rape you, to beat you to keep you from being with your family, to keep you from going to school. Nobody has that right. That's criminal behavior. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I think we're going, we can go forward now. Sorry. I mean, I live in shelters, just so you know that too. I live in shelters. I live in emergency rooms. I live in prisons with women who've killed. Um, just to stop this right here, you know, I really, before my book was published, I needed, I needed to, to know better women who killed their husbands in self-defense. <coughs> the last chapter in Living with the Enemy is all about that, the stories of women who killed their abusers, and they got the longest prison sentences of all. Compared to the men who you know, brutally, like, stabbed or beat their wives to death, we usually would get like three to four years. If a woman who killed in self-defense tried to prove that in court, the courts would really punish her and usually give her between 30 to 50 years, no parole. So when I finally got permission from a prison in Missouri um, to go and see, it was right before Christmas, and, um, and I was meeting with all the women and really like, uh, you know, it was a maximum security prison. Um, so it was incredible to hear their stories and then I went back to the superintendent of the prison and I said, you know what, I want to live in this prison, can, can I do that? And he said, Donna, it's like Christmas Eve coming up, why do you want to, why do you want to be in this prison, are you crazy? And I said, I want to be in here, I care about these women, I want to know what they're going through. So because he thought I was completely crazy, he, he let me live in the prison. And that's how I got a lot of the stories that I got that you can see in uh, Living with the Enemy. 
Now, you know, press is really important. Awards, I, I really think a lot of it is bullshit. Um, the only award that really made a huge difference in my life was the W. Eugene Smith Award, because before I received that, nobody would publish any of my pictures. Nobody took me seriously. I don't walk around like I'm like, you know, a hot shit kind of photographer. Um, I believe in myself, but I don't, I don't really subscribe to that pack mentality. Um, so when I got the Eugene Smith, suddenly that, that gave me like some credibility. It wasn't about the money. I got $7,500 because I split the award with Letizia Battaglia. Let's, let's go ahead and you'll see her. And she had done this amazing body of work on the mafia in Sicily. And she came and stayed with me when she got the award. So there's Letizia, there's Howard Chapnick, Sam Garcia, John Morris. This was uh, Soy Bell, who was uh, Fred Richin, um, Marty <coughs> Forsher, right? And so we each got 7,500 bucks, you know? But it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about that. I mean, for the TTS, 7,500 bucks went a long way in Palermo back in the 80s, in the mid-80s. For me, flying all around the country, renting cars, all that sort of stuff, the money went fast. So it really wasn't about the money. It was like, I am so grateful to the Eugene Smith for recognizing that this is a story that had to be told. Perhaps without the Eugene Smith, I don't know, it probably would have taken me five more years to get anything published. This was not a story that the media was interested in at all. They, they, they were very uncomfortable with it. With all of these stories, like with the Head and Nuss Bomb story, it's a very complicated story. I'm not going to go into it, but all of these women, Head and Nuss Bomb, Lisa, they have all become friends. I check in with them from time to time. I know where she's hiding because she's so afraid Joel Steinberg lives somewhere up here now. He brutally beat his daughter, his adopted daughter, to death. Um, it's, a, it's a really shocking story, and she's had to go to another part of the country and change her identity. But, you know, and I, I would always go and film her, interview her through the 15 years that passed after this happened. And I would always ask her this one question, like, Hannah, is there any way that we could have reached you before he beat, before Joel beat little Lisa to death? Is there anything anybody could have ever told you? Because he was beating her so badly. You see, look at, she was like blind nearly in this side. He kept beating her with a big exercise bar. He would beat her legs so that it was just like, you know, gangrene. And, and her ear was like a, a, a fighter, a prize fighter's ear, all cauliflower. Um, go ahead, there's the next picture. I mean, she really believed that he was her savior. He was going to change her. He was going to make her into a better person. And she didn't believe that he could do any harm to her, the adopted children. Through the years, we've done, we did about, you know, over 500 shows that traveled all around the world, um, raising money for shelters and batterers programs. I mean, I, you know, I wanted <coughs> these pictures to reach everybody. This is my co-chair, Jane Smith, at the Domestic Abuse Awareness Project. And um, the story right there of, of Janice was turned into a beautiful card. Um, her story's in the book. That's a really chilling story, Janice's story. Uh, and actually, what I'm doing by showing you a few of these pictures is to show you how through the years, I've used these photographs in more creative ways. I mean, I don't have any problem taking pictures that I've used or anybody else taking them and making them into something better. Do something. I, I think we have to keep evolving. Go ahead. A uh, little letter from Tip of Moore. Oh, one thing that's funny to tell you is that, you know, it wasn't like I convinced Hillary Clinton to... Um, to let me go into her secret chambers. I actually paid for her. 
I bought her for $4,500 at a yeah. child care auction uh, campaign back before they were in the White House. And I knew that I really felt like Hillary and Bill were going to be in the White House. I believed in them. And so I took my daughter to this little this auction one night and um, where Hillary was being auctioned off. And uh, a tea party with Hillary Clinton for eight people. And um, so I had my daughter watch the piece of paper. It was a silent auction. And uh, as I went around the whole room canvassing it for money, you know, I needed money to be able to like, you know, I wanted to go, uh, every time I put down a thousand, two thousand, some big shot woman from Time Warner would come over and put down another thousand. So, and I, honestly, I, I don't have any trust funds. I'm a freelance photographer. You know, I gotta, I gotta like squeeze it from all the rich people in the room. So I managed to put $4,500 down on that piece of paper and we did it at the final moment so the other women couldn't, couldn't pop my bid, uh, thanks to Fanny. And so, so afterwards, this rich woman from Time Warner, she came up to me and she said, who are you anyway? You know, why are you putting down all this money? For, because remember, Hillary Clinton was still in the governor's house in, um, where was that? Arkansas. Yeah, in Arkansas. So, uh, so I said, I said, who are you? And she said, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm with Time Warner and I want to have a really nice party with Hillary and all my friends. And I said, oh yeah? Well, I'm Donna Ferrato, and I really believe that you know violence against women has to stop. And I need to talk to Hillary because I know she's going to be in that White House, you know, in a few months. So, butt out of this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great. So we got we got that tea party, and I took. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to show you. Um, there's there with Hillary. That's the book, Living with the Enemy. Um, and it was pretty amazing, you know, to meet with, I took my dad, he voted for Bush. I told him, if you vote for Bush, dad, I'm not going to take you with me when, when I go to meet Hillary. And uh, I'm not going to listen to you, Donna, I'm a man, I'm not going to listen to you. So of course he voted for Bush. So I said, okay, dad, you can come to this tea party, um, but you can't speak. You have to be very, very quiet. No words. <laughs> And so he was very quiet, but he was so smart, too. Because I would have never sat next to Hillary. I was sitting over on the other side. He made me get closer to her. And I didn't bring my books at all. He brought them. And so he said, get her to sign. Like, I have books that she signed. I have covers of Time Magazine that she signed. The disturbing thing about Hillary, for all of us, because I had eight of the most powerful women in the domestic violence community come with me, meet me there. And we wanted her to talk about domestic violence as a serious platform in the administration. She would not. She said she, was, she wanted us to teach her about the language, but she didn't really think that this was such an issue like we said it was. And she said to us something that just devastated the women um, in the room. She said, you know, I'm a lawyer, and I've defended a lot of battered women. And I know things can get really bad, but you know what? We lawyers, we, we get them their divorces, and we get them the protection orders, and then they go right back to these abusers. And she looked at us all, and she said, I think women, and I had Lisa, I had Lisa from the book in the same room, sitting in front of her. And then she looked at us, and she said, I really think that women have to take responsibility for the violence in their lives. So this was like, what, like 1992. We were really shocked. Everybody was speechless. And then I said to her, okay, Hillary, I understand where you're coming from. But you know what? Now that we have this, we have these new laws. You know, we have the protection orders. And a lot of women are doing what we tell them to do. You know, we say, get out of the marriage, get a divorce, leave him. And they do that. But they're getting hunted down and slaughtered like dogs. And it's leaving their children without any mother. What do you want to say to their children, Hillary? And Hillary had nothing to say. You know, she's a very articulate, very charming woman. She had nothing to say. And we were all pretty pissed off at her, I have to tell you. You know the truth. Um, but her words never left my head. I have been thinking about these words for more than, you know, 20 years. And that's also part of the unbeatable campaign, 
is that I really do think now we have more shelters. The story is out there. Police do know what is the right thing to do. We have to support the women to leave, but really women do have to do whatever they can to get out of those relationships sooner than later. Because the longer they stay in these relationships, the more of a feeding frenzy starts in the, in the minds of these abusers. I mean, when they get the taste of blood, they want more. So whatever it takes for women to get out of these relationships, we have to help them. And really, you know, it's a really horrible thing when women just stay in it and stay in it until they're murdered or the kids die. <coughs> My feeling is it's better to die free than to die like a caged animal. Stop here for a second. So this shows the kinds of things that I've been doing through the years. I make these posters like this, like this. I went to the trial for Hedda Nussbaum when she was prosecuting Joel much later for all the abuse. These are all the things that he did to her. Like so many shocking things. And so so I create these things and then I and then I um, have parties and events, <coughs> rich people's houses, and then we raise money for her to be able to promote the you know, precedent-setting legal decisions that someone like Hedda Nussbaum was able to put into effect. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of work, as you all know, to have a non-for-profit, and you have to raise a lot of money. And during those years that I was running the non-for-profit, which was about 15 years, I didn't really take pictures anymore. You know, you have, to, you have to be there. I did a lot of lecturing and speaking about domestic violence. But I pretty much stopped taking pictures seriously um, until, you know, like 2006. Go ahead. Just stop right here. Um, um, how did I raise the money to put these shows together? Uh, you know, I was able to do the first show that was for a shelter in New York City, um, Sanctuary for Families, um, with some of the money that I had and raised. Um, but And we started doing these sh shows that traveled around. But when it went to Mexico, um, as it was coming back, it was stolen in the airport, and the, the uh, museum in Mexico City didn't have any insurance to cover it. So, so then I had to go about raising serious money. And the only corporation that would give us money was um, uh, Kraft Foods slash, um, what is the tobacco company? Philip Morris. Um, Morris. Now, a lot of people would say, how can you take money from Philip Morris? You know what, I had no problem with it. There were no other corporations that were willing, not even the insurance companies that make so much money off of battered women. Nobody would. Women smoke a lot in shelters. Women smoke, I, you know, they do it. Okay, so I say take their money and put it to good use. So we created three shows. And these shows went, and they also helped. The women who were running the non-for-profit division of Philip Morris and Kraft Foods, they would also, take on my, my um, I had a slideshow presentation, 
they sent those slideshows all around the world. And these photographs went all around the world with the, you know, I mean, it was, it was a fantastic period, especially after the whole O.J. Simpson thing, where, and I always thought it was a good thing that O.J. Simpson got away with killing his wife, because if he had gone to prison, everybody would have said, oh, see, the, you know, the laws work, and it's not so bad, and he got justice, but because he got, he was, he was found not guilty, you know, we were all really angry. There was so much more work to do. So actually, throughout the 90s, we did many, like hundreds and hundreds of exhibits across the world, and were able to raise a lot of money. I never took any of the money. Whatever money was raised was kept by the organizations that were putting on these shows. You know, they had to pay me $1,700 for the show. That went into my organization. I didn't get a salary from it. Um, the only way that I made money in those years was by doing lectures. And I got paid very well to do lectures, but it wasn't from the money that came in for these pictures. I really didn't want to make money off of these pictures. Go ahead. <coughs> i just let you in on a little secret right here. See this right here? This is one of my logos here. This is the clip of steel logo. And that goes on all of my <laughs> because you know, to be it, you know, go like into these situations and do what you think has to be done, you gotta be really tough. You know, you have to have nerves of steel. And so this is like this, like a, a lock that's broken. That's a symbol of foot of steel. time do we have? Have I already gone way over? Mike? No, we're, we're pretty free form. Yeah. We'll keep going for a while. Because, yeah, this, this is probably the most important story that I ever did. And it's the one that matters the most to me. Um, let's, uh, let's get into it. One day I'm reading the paper. And I see this story in there, trapped by window bars, Aiden family die in a fire. I don't understand. You know, how can a family die so fast like that? And so I read it again and again, and I, I really, um, I'm crying. I'm hurting so bad when I read how these children were doing everything they could in school to do right. Like their mother was in prison, but the grandma, Minnie, was taking care of them. And they were like a little 18-month-old baby who was the great-granddaughter of Minnie, the grandma. And then there were all these other kids that went up to the age of 16, 17. And they were all working hard. They went to school and, you know, they never went to school dirty. They may have holes in their clothes, but the grandma always patched them. She worked in, a, in you know, picking potatoes. And even the teacher said, these were great kids. You know, they lived with their grandmother. They came up the hard way. They worked through the hardships of their backgrounds, and they really had come a long way. So I wanted to know more. So I started calling around the fire department, everybody that I could, the teachers. And the, one of the teachers turned me on to a woman named Minnie. And I called Minnie, and I said, you know, I want to come out there for the funeral. Can you help me? And she said, sure, I will, Donna. And, and uh, I said, well, how am I going to recognize you? And she said, I'm the only one-armed woman in town. So then I went to all my contacts at Life Magazine, People Magazine, all the magazines where I work, and said, I, come on, give me like a plane ticket. Give me some, you know, like a day, one day rate to go out there and to piece this whole thing together. And one of the most important editors in the city, even today, actually said to me, Look at Donna. These are just poor black people. Who's going to care about them a couple months from now? You know, American people are not interested. So forget about it, Donna. You know, come on. We'll give you a much more important, exciting celebrity story to do. So I said, fuck you. And then I got on a plane the next day and made it to Bruce, Mississippi in time for this funeral that was happening, not knowing what I was going to find. All I knew was that their family was so poor, they had no money. Go 
Go ahead for the next picture. Um, this is, so this that that you know just so you know that 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 those metal bars on the ground, that's what kept the family locked up in this house because they weren't opening from the inside as they should have been. They were opening from the outside. Here was this young man who was trying to figure out how how did the family die in there. At one point, he even tried to drive his car through the burning house, but he was afraid that it would all explode. I mean, everybody was trying to get them out. This is Minnie and her daughter. So she really took me under, you know, under her care and and made sure that I would get to meet all the right people and she explained so much to me. She was she 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 was fantastic. She was the aunt to the children who had died. Go ahead. Um, there were no pictures. These people didn't have pictures of the kids. You know, I had to go around from house to house and look for various pictures or get the pictures from school books. So this is when I first arrived, and I go into the gym. I don't know who's the mother. I don't know who anybody is. And I see in the gym under the basketball hoops three coffins, and the you know eight people were were in those coffins. Um, and then I noticed out in the room that was full of people that one woman seemed to keep crying and collapsing, um, and I recognized that she had to be the mother. So let's stop on here for a second. So, you know, I'm talking to photographers here so I can tell you, like, how I think. You know, when I see that she's in the middle and she's unconscious and all these women in white are all around her, they're trying to help her, I don't, like, stand on the outside and try to take pictures or whatever. I got down on my knees and crawled <coughs> between their legs till I got right there and could get the picture that I needed at that moment to show her at her moment of deepest agony. And none of the women like got mad at me. Nobody said, what are you doing that for, white women? Get out of here. They were so gracious and so kind, and they were so happy that somebody was there documenting. There were no other photographers there. Nobody else cared, not even the local newspapers. Nobody was there. Go ahead. kept wondering how domestic violence would, it wasn't, why was she in prison? Was she in prison for killing her husband? I, I didn't, then I found out she was in prison for, here's the mother right here, for um, uh, stealing checks, social security checks out of mailboxes, you know, so, okay, so for a while I thought it didn't have anything to do with domestic violence, um, and then, you know, I didn't know who her brother was. I really didn't know. This was honestly within an hour and a half of being there. Um, and then I saw her being carried in on the shoulder of this man. And later on, Minnie told me the story of how her brother there had killed their abusive father 20 years before. And that's what damaged them as children. I mean, they didn't have to grow up with it anymore. So here you see there's, there is Ree, the mother, and her brother, and her friends all around her. Um, I mean, you know, she lost her entire family. Mother, and it, only her one son wasn't there at the time, so she still had him. But after this day, she had to go back to prison.
let's stop here just for a second. I mean, you know, this is what it's all about, right, in the church. But I don't accept that. I don't really accept it. I really think, you know, God, whatever God has in mind for us, we have to work very hard to make it go in the right way, too. God isn't going to help anybody who's not helping themselves. So when I went to church a few days later after the funeral, um, and, I, and I went in and I saw how everybody, this pastor was actually saying to the whole congregation that this was God's will, that he had other plans for these children, and that they were in a better place, and nobody should feel too bad, that it was going to be all right. And the women were all crying in the church, and the men were just looking very stoic, and I was getting angrier and angrier until... Finally, the pastor said, you know, excuse me, miss, but we've been seeing you around in our neighborhoods um, a lot lately, and you look like you have something to say right now. You want to come up and talk? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> so I went up there, and I said, look it, you know, I'm from New York. I don't know this family like you all do. I just read about them in the New York Times. But... It hurts me so much to think that children who were trying so hard to do good with their life would end up dying like animals, you know, in a burning house. And that their grandma, Minnie, who did not deserve to die, none of them did, would end up like that. This is not right. And I said, you have to understand, this has nothing to do with God. This has to do with greed. And the fact is, is that the landlord had put these metal bars on the windows that didn't open from the inside. They were from the outside. So we need to have a plan. And so then the, the minister said to me, well, it was Super Bowl Sunday night. He said, well, would you like to come back here tonight and meet with some people and you can create a couple of teams and tell them what you're thinking, all right? And I said, yeah, I'll do that. So that night we met at the church and I set up two teams, the two, two women in town, Minnie was one of them, um, who, who seemed to be the most activist types. And I said, this is what you have to do. From now on, you go to every single uh, town council meeting and you demand to see the fire books. You know, you want to see what the ordinance are. We need to know if these metal bars are illegal. Maybe they're, maybe they're illegal to put that on. And if it is, then we have to change the law. Either way, you have to change the laws. I told the people in the church that, that afternoon, you pay taxes. You guys are citizens of the United States. You've got to stand up for your rights. You have to. Or the same thing is going to happen to you. So that, then I went back to New York. And now I had some pictures. And I had big pictures printed up. And then I went into People Magazine. And I called a meeting now. And I had everybody, Lanny Jones, all the photo editors, and I put the pictures out on the table. And I started to tell them the story. And as Lanny Jones was, you know, kind of a delicate looking little guy, <laughs> as he would walk by looking, I'd push him really hard. And this is what happened, and that's what happened. So he said, okay, Donna, look it. We'll let you go back. We want you to go back. We'll give you a writer. We'll pay for your time there. No problem. Okay, so then I went back. Go ahead. And so I had this great writer, and because um, really you got to have a good writer with you. And, you know, these kinds of things are going on. Like the police, even though the family had just died, okay, well, forget about that. This is the most important. No, no, no. No. Okay, see, that's Eddie Chandler putting all these ridiculous notes everywhere. He was always making the people live in fear because of the drug dealers who were everywhere. But he let them on the property. This guy was really the personification of evilness and very lazy. He had been a bootlegger, sold his whiskey, he ran bordellos on the property. He was really an evil, lazy son of a you-know-what. So, so this is him. So I go with the writer into his house. I need to see Eddie Chandler. He was only living about 100 feet away from the burning house. And he's lying on the sofa like this, and I said to him, what happened that night? Why did these people die? And he said, well, you know, I heard, I was sleeping with my wife. I heard the fire alarms, and I knew the trucks were out there. And I said to my wife, you know what, those kids are all dead by now. He had the, he had the keys. These are all the keys to the metal bars right there in the whole community, right there on his window. 
and he didn't want to move his lazy butt to get up there. So for me, this was the man who was the big problem. And that's what I told everybody in the town. And what happened was, you know, when Ree got out of prison, she did sue him. I don't know how much money she got out of it, but she sued him. And, um, Life Ma and People Magazine published the story. And you know, the, the best moment of my life was getting on a plane about six months later and seeing in USA Today um, this little tiny article that said that the people of Bruce, Mississippi had gone to Jackson, Mississippi. They'd gone there by buses and they met with the legislators and they changed the laws. So in Mississippi, these metal bars are no longer legal. Nobody <coughs> can do that anymore. And, you know, I think it's really important for photographers <coughs> to realize that we cannot put our, you know, all of our energy into magazines and expect them to do our work. We have to do the work. We have to speak to the people. We have to get involved with their lives. We have to help them, you know? We really do, because we know a lot. And it's not just about taking pictures. That's only the first step. Go I just didn't want them to die in vain, you know? It, they suffered so much. So this unbeatable, I am unbeatable campaign has been going on for a while. It's, um, and this is the woman that I've been spending a lot of time with to tell her story. Um, we're, we're creating these little 30 second to 15 second spots that'll be used um, through a social media marketing campaign. Um, but as well, um, her story takes place in Nashville, Tennessee and um, uh, I've been working with her for two years now. It's, it's really difficult to tell these kinds of stories because there's no big drama. It's a lot more psychological and emotional. Things never seem to get better. Um, I mean, she's not being beaten by her abuser, but he uses the courts now to beat her down. He uses the courts to keep extorting money from her and terrorizing the children. And the courts go with it. The courts are always being more sympathetic to the man. Um, so that's the story that we're trying to tell, and uh, there's going to be an ex a big exhibit in Nashville um, next fall, um, and then it'll start to travel around the country. Let's keep going. <coughs> what? Oh, no, no, no. We already saw this, right? I think we did. Um, no, we didn't. Okay, need some wine.
Haiku's very <coughs> short videos to show you. They described the nightmares they continued to have, the fears. Especially as Tommy, he can hear those cocks. And the blood was all over him. He talks about that. I don't know why my daddy made me stay in there. I don't know why my daddy wouldn't let me leave. I think some of it started when I was pregnant. I can't remember exactly what happened first and when everything took the turn because I didn't even realize it as it was happening. He wanted to have sex every day from the time I was 14 until about the time I was 18 or 19. It was every day. And if, if I just wasn't in the mood or if I was on my period or something like that, he'd come in to inspect me. I'd go in to take a shower. He'd kick down my bedroom door. He'd come in and, and I'd tell him no. And he'd push me down onto the bed and pry my legs apart to try and see whether or not I'd had sex with someone else. He'd tell me he didn't the difference. And then uh, he ripped my eyebrow ring out. He started with the eyebrow ring and he would just hold it and act like he was going to rip it out. And he'd be screaming at me the whole time he was doing this. So he's like telling me what I'm going to do or what I'm going to say to make him happy. And if, if I refuse, he'd pull it harder and pull it harder until it would bleed. And then when it would start bleeding, sometimes he would just stop or, or sometimes he'd keep going and be like, yeah, we should have listened. And, and then eventually he just ended up carrying it all the way out. But he also, he held me down and he, he would put his knees on my shoulders so I couldn't move and hit me in the face until uh, he cracked my jaw. I tried to leave him over and over again, but it was really hard. Like when, when the kids were away at his parents' house, when I told him, I'm like, listen, I really can't do this anymore. It's not good for me or you or the kids. I can't do this anymore. And I told him while we were out driving, which was a huge mistake. And he started acting like he was going to crash the car into a guardrail. And he said that uh, if, if he couldn't have me, that, that neither of us needed to live. And, and I was like, what about the kids? What about the kids? I was screaming and trying to tell him that this isn't the way to do things. And he wouldn't listen. He kept on trying to wreck it. And I, I'd grab the wheel and try and get him to stop. And... Uh, at one point, I finally got the car into park and pulled the keys out, and uh, I called his parents, and I told them what happened. I said, he's trying to kill us, and I'm freaking out, screaming at the same time. Please talk to your son. Please talk to him. Please calm him down. And his dad answered, and his dad's like, well, put him on the phone, and, and then I put it on speakerphone because he wouldn't take the phone from me, and he's like, if I were you, I would have just blacked both their eyes. I would have pulled her out by the hair of her head and blacked both their eyes and stuff like that. And... I, I found out later that he had had this all on speakerphone. He had had the kids had heard me freaking out and crying and screaming, saying that their dad was trying to kill us both. And they, they just let him hear all of that.